Please join me in welcoming Des Trainer, who's going to talk to you about the evolution of products in 2016. Thank you. So <clears throat> it's wonderful to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about a really happy topic today: uh, death. So, yeah, yeah. it is the nature of our industry. It is the nature of technology. Every product dies. Uh, that's a somewhat morbid. Well, not so much. That's a very fucking morbid thought. Uh, but um, if you don't believe me on that, you know, page me or fax me or <laughs> write me up something on your typewriter. Right? They were all epic businesses once upon a time, but they are no more. And Death is on my mind for a lot of reasons. I think it, like, it is the nature of every technology to die. It is the nature of, therefore, a lot of technology businesses to die, which leaves you with a sort of an eternal question of how can we stay alive. Now, I wasn't always so morbid. Um, uh, this is us the day after we signed our incorporation paper in San Francisco back in 2011. And uh, we were obviously a lot happier then. <laughs> uh, but um, Intercom has been uh, something of a, uh, of a roller coaster. Uh, a very good roller coaster, like real Six Flags shit. Um, but like, uh, it's like here is a graph of some metric that I can't disclose what it is, but it's a good one uh, for uh, for Intercom. And there's been effectively like there's been a few different phases in Intercom. Uh, the way I think about it, I kind of obviously have the longer view because I've been there since our sort of embryonic stage. But the phases that I can kind of roughly identify are sort of the phase when the product was being born, and the phase when we had to then go and grow up the product, and Lastly, the phase where we really have to survive, right? The phase where, like, all right, we've made something. How do we keep relevant in technological cycle after cycle after cycle? Put another way, we have to make it work. We have to make it grow, and now we have to keep it relevant. We have to give, you know, keep a reason out there why folks like you and many more will continue to like, look to or see, use Intercom. And you know, to Intercom today, we have like uh, over 10,000 customers. We've tens of millions of revenue, 160 million dollars raised. Uh, all of these things should be cause for celebration, but in practice, like the reality is, we've never felt more vulnerable in a sense. It's like we spent so long hoping that something could come along and exist, only for it then to exist, and you're like, holy shit, what if it goes away? <laughs> and you, you kind of get that sense because like, I've put, I guess, a seventh of my life into Intercom, which makes me 35, I'll save you the maths. Um, <laughs> But that's a significant chunk of time to work on anything. And, uh, and you know, for sure, the idea that it might one day no longer be uh, is terrifying. Uh, and like the weird thing is, this isn't what we were sold, right? When we read all the books about startups and you hear, hear how it's supposed to work, the deal with startups I always thought was, you crawl through 100 yards of shit and you're free, you know? Uh, <laughs> but, um, but what it actually is more like is you crawl through 100 yards of shit and then your options are, much like Andy Dufresne says, get busy living or get busy dying. So, how do you stay relevant? How do you stay alive? Now, the thing is, when you actually look at all the literature, at all the advice, at the blog posts, the articles, the podcasts, the conference talks, uh, it's all about creating and starting and creating and starting and creating and starting, because everyone wants to do that, and that's basically what people write about. And we've certainly we've added our own stuff along the way. Uh, you know, as we spoke earlier about it, we have done a lot of uh, content along the way. But the one reality is like, none of this shit matters if you're ignoring existential threats, right? If there's some reason, if there's some ticking bomb, or if there's some train coming down the tracks, and you don't care because you're too busy, like uh, you know, navel gazing, you're going to be in trouble. And on that note, like I really like this quote from Andy Grove when he sort of says, like, any degree of success will breed complacency. Any degree of complacency will breed failure. Therefore, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> um, so I was sharing these thoughts with a friend recently, and uh, his comment to me because he was also a startup founder, he's just slightly further along, but he said, well, the, the thing you have to realize is that the present is the past. And I was like, I don't do drugs, so, uh, <laughs> okay. uh, And he's like, no, 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 listen to me, listen to me. He's like, your product's already obsolete. And I was like, well, what do you mean by that? Like, people like it. And he was like, well, the thing is, people like what's out there today, but what's out there today is actually already history. It's been, it's been documented, there are changes pages updated, but it's live, it's now a part of history. And the thing you should be worrying about there is, is like that there's probably going to be a newer, faster, quicker way for your customers to achieve what they want to do in this world, and that it doesn't involve you. And I was like, ooh, that kind of stung. Uh, <laughs> so, and like the way it was described to me, was he sort of said, like, you know, it'll feel like you're on solid ground. It'll feel like everything's going great. And you'll feel a couple of trembles here and a competitor there and a couple of different shifts. You're like, all right, you know what? We got this. We got this. We're good at product, whatever. But at some point, you realize something's actually changing. And you're like, oh, shit. So you start trying to react, 
But by the time you actually realize it, you're like, oh, too late. Uh, the ground has been torn out from under you. And the worst part is you don't feel it. It's purely asymptomatic, right? Uh, and if you don't believe you don't feel it or that, or, or, that, or that it can happen even when times are good, let me put it to you this way. Wasn't 2007 a great year to be a sat-nav manufacturer? <laughs> Things could not have been better. Everyone, we were all buying them and putting them in our cars, and they were shit devices, but we didn't care. And then somewhere in the Moscone Center in San Francisco in FIDI, uh, someone waves a new thing around, and poof, and business no more, right? Both companies have not restored, I think at best they're like a sixth of their former selves, and they've never really gotten back. And you know, it's, it's, it's a fun version to presume that they're all literally purely asleep at the cash register, totally ignoring all, all these new threats. The reality is I'm sure they watched the keynote and shot themselves. I'm sure they ran straight to the whiteboards. They probably pulled the product team in on weekends. I'm sure they you know, fired up Jira, and when it loaded up, they were like, all right, let's go and start writing some tickets. <laughs> and, uh, and customers don't wait around while you're writing up these fucking Jira tickets, right? Like, uh, like the world will move on with or without you. Uh, so, and another simpler example that we all know, and some of you might be familiar with this graph, uh, the light blue represents a product called SMS. And SMS, uh, if you're not familiar, represents about 80 to 90% of how telcos make profits. Uh, aside from exorbitant roaming charges, SMS is the other way they make money. And, uh, and SMS was a phenomenal technology. It's a liquid profit. It's unreal, unrivaled. And then 30 engineers, which is about like the first few rows here, got together and built a different thing called WhatsApp. And within the space of two years, they'd basically obliterated the majority of the growth in the most profitable uh, area of these uh, of telcos. Now, it's important to say I am talking about the growth here because businesses can't survive on stagnation. They need to grow because ultimately, on a long enough time frame, all their customers will die, right? Uh, so you do need new customers. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so you can't flatline as a business. Flatline actually means you're going down as well. Uh, but the, re the way this plays out typically is a new thread emer emerges and they typically are like, oh, yawn, who gives a shit? Someone started the product, who cares? And then eventually I'm sure WhatsApp puts out a press release going, we've just got our 100,000 user. And they're like, ha, 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 100,000 users, God, what a joke. And then at some point WhatsApp puts out a press release saying we have our 100 million user. And they're like, oh, huh. <laughs> and then by the time they decide to fight, it is literally already a done deal. And there's no turning back. And if that framing sounds familiar to you, it's because uh, you know, it's words of Gandhi, uh, who's obviously got a lot of great quotes, and he's not necessarily a product manager. But, um, <laughs> but one of the points uh, he said, and if I was like, you know, to take Gandhi's words and put them out at you, it's like this idea that like, at first you'll ignore them, then you'll laugh at them, then you'll fight them, and then they will win. And that is, tends to be people's attitude towards new products. So if you want to see the best example of like, what it means to first laugh at something, uh, a new threat, I really like uh, the reaction of one Steve Ballmer to the iPhone. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. <laughs> and I'm sure he had a good laugh. Uh, you know. But that is like, you know, and obviously, to be fair to Balmer, uh, like, obviously, you put a camera in front of me, he has to say something defensive. But, like, uh, but it is true that, like, you know, at the time he identified, he, the clip goes on and he says something along the lines of, I prefer the Windows phone position in the market. We have a $79 phone, it has a keyboard, blah, blah, blah. That would be fine if all, you know, the, the mobile revolution, the new Android and iOS thing, if all they did was kill Windows phone, that would be fine. Windows phone wasn't a huge thing for Microsoft, it was a part of their Windows Everywhere strategy. But if you look at this graph, mobile didn't actually kill Windows Phone. Mobile is the orange here, and what the dark line there isn't actually Windows Mobile. The dark line is actually the whole entire desktop concept, right? Which scares the shit out of Microsoft because that was the core, right? So it wasn't actually like you know they were killed by something. It wasn't obvious that like a phone could be really really bad news for a desktop operating system, but it turned out to be. And the realization there, uh, for me, uh, it's best summed up in a quote by Steve Sanofsky, who is actually uh, ex-Microsoft, he's now at Andreessen Horowitz. But he makes the point about this idea that all these technologies just intertwine with each other. It's not clear that a phone was going to destroy a satellite navigation company. It's not clear that a messaging thing would destroy a tel telecoms company, like a software company could disrupt telecoms. And it's not clear that a phone would disrupt desktop. But what actually happens here is there are these tectonic shifts that happen in technology 
like literally the plates slide from under you. And if you're not aware of all of them and how they actually interact, you're in big trouble. So to go back to Intercom for a second, you know, as I often say, like we didn't come this far to only come this far, right? So how do we actually keep going? How do we make sure that, that we don't just get caught up in one wave and e end up? And the question that keeps coming back to for me is, there, you know, technology will just continue to spit out innovation after innovation after innovation. And the question you have to consistently train everyone to ask is this. Does this new technology that's happening or that is being released make it in any way cheaper, faster, or easier for our customers to make progress in their lives? And that's the re repetitive question you have to ask, when you, whether you see like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi or cloud or mobile or touch or voice or audio or anything, uh, messaging, bots, you name it. It's, does it make it cheaper, easier, or faster for our customers to make the progress in their lives? Because if it does, they'll go there and you'll be busy writing up Jira tickets. So, and connected to that is this point that the things that we need to do in our lives actually rarely change, but the ways that we can do them will always change. Uh, there is very few new behaviors in life. So to give you some random examples, like for as long as there have been kids in schools, there have been kids passing notes to each other in schools. And the protocol with notes is that like, you make sure no one else can see it, you rip it up or you eat it if the teacher catches it, but you just get rid of the fucking thing. And, uh, so like, the idea that this was a disposable message that can be passed between two people that only for their eyes only uh, has gone on today, and we know it best today as Snapchat, right? Uh, which w one of its core purposes is that exact job. Now, Snapchat has some other purposes, we won't get into it. Um, but um, another example for me is like, you know, we, those of you who are closer to my age will probably remember, have probably had something like this under your bed, right? Which is a box that you put photos in. Now, these photos, curiously, they're not on a shelf for everyone to see. They're specifically for you and you only want them at certain times. And today we, we use technologies like, say, iPhoto or uh, Dropbox's Carousel when it was around to do this exact same job. The, the need has not changed, but the job has. If you're renovating a house, in the old days, you'd have a scrapbook with all the shit you can't afford. Today you do it with House or Pinterest, right? Um, but like, the need doesn't change. The ways you can do it always changes. And the way you have to stay relevant is you have to pay attention to what's called this like, OODA loop, which is... OODA being, can you observe, can you orient, can you decide, and can you act? And if your OODA loop is basically fast enough such that you can keep up with the industry, you will always be in a great position. However, if you are slower than the industry, you'll be in trouble. And I'll play that out with a very simple example. If on the left here is the speed at which you can observe, orient, decide, and act, and on the right is the industry's general ability to try out new ideas and stuff, if you're faster, Every time the industry spits out something new, like let's say the industry pops out cloud, you can release something that works with cloud. And you can release many iterations and you can consistently evolve and build new stuff. The very second mobile comes out, you can hit mobile straight away because you can move as fast as the industry or faster. And that's really, really important. But the very second this arrow changes direction and you find yourself moving slower than the industry, it's game over. It's really, really troublesome. So they're spitting out technology after technology after technology, and your team are still talking in years and Q4 2018 and shit like that. So as the technology changes, you then find yourself being the company who, like, who like in 2016 says, we're now available online, you know? Um, <laughs> and like, what that looks like best like the way, is the way Marshall McLuhan described it, is this idea of like walking backwards into the future, right? So you, you are moving into the future whether you like it or not, but your vision hasn't changed. You're still trying to force old world ideas into a new world. Um, so like, that's why, for me, it just constantly comes back to this question. Like, every time something changes, it's just, it's, can we be cheaper, faster, quicker, or easier?